Welcome to this uh, new lecture of Robotics 2. Today we will consider uh, a new alternative method for achieving regulation in the presence of gravity. Uh, we will use a simple version of uh, what we can call an iterative, iterative learning scheme that acquire information while doing the task in order to compensate exactly the gravity at destination. So our objective uh, will be uh, to handle the presence of gravity, but differently from what we have seen uh, in previous lecture, uh, we don't use uh, uh, information about the model, in particular about the gravity term, nor for canceling gravity in every configuration, nor for uh, compensating gravity at the destination. We don't make use of uh, high positional gains, which would reduce, although not eliminate completely, the position error at steady state. And differently from the use of PID or saturated PID, uh, we would like to uh, find a control scheme that does not require uh, condition, special condition on the control gain uh, to be chosen, which would guarantee convergence. Now, the scheme is based on uh, iteration, iteration that are uh, not repeated trial of the same motion task, but require some intermediate stage while moving toward the destination. The control law is very simple, is a PD control on the joint position error, to which we add a constant fit forward term. If we, were, uh, if we had the knowledge of the uh, gravity vector in the dynamic model, this constant fit forward term would be uh, the gravity at the destination, so G of QD. But we assume that we don't have this knowledge. So we will uh, uh, iteratively update this fit forward term while we move from a, a steady state condition to another under the action of this control law. Uh, the goal is to verify if we can find sufficient condition that guarantees a global property to this iterative scheme, so convergence uh, to the desired state with zero final error, both in position and velocity. Velocity for regulation task should be zero at destination, so this is not our main problem. So, uh, we will use... Uh, couple of uh, preliminary results, in particular, given the robot dynamic model in the usual Euler-Lagrange form, uh, we assume the existence uh, and the knowledge only of a bound on the gradient of the gravity vector term. Uh, we have seen that the G over the Q is indeed a, a, a symmetric matrix. Um, not necessarily positive definite, so uh, the norm will be the, uh, of this matrix will be the maximum uh, eigenvalue of the product of the matrix by its transpose, and then extracting the square root. So we assume that this quantity, this norm, is upper bounded by an alpha, and alpha, of course, can be very conservative. Now, if we try to regulate uh, a desired position for this robot, for a generic robot, using a joint error and a PD law, so without considering the presence of gravity, nor canceling, nor compensating gravity at all, so we would like, a, we would apply a, a PD control of the form shown in the slide, with typically a positive definite and symmetric KP and KD matrices. Typically, we choose those as diagonal. Now we know that this control law cannot regulate uh, the uh, desired configuration because it does not provide that steady state if at the desired steady state, namely when the error in position is zero and the velocity is zero, the torque which balances the gravity at the destination. So for a generic task, this will not work. So what happens is that we will find at steady state 
uh, an equilibrium which has a non-zero error left. Let's call this equilibrium uh, configuration Q bar, and since we are at steady state, and this is an equilibrium necessarily, as we have seen for mechanical system, Q dot should be zero. So we implicitly know that at this steady state, the residual error QD minus Q bar multiplied by the gain uh, balances the gravity in that configuration, which is not the one which is desired. So we have a, an error E bar, which is the difference from QD, uh, between QD and Q bar. And this is different from zero. Now remember that this steady state may be different in general uh, from uh, depending on where we started and uh, what type of uh, gain, proportional gain we're, we are using. But anyway, we, whatever this steady state will be, uh, there will be an, an error. So uh, the idea is to slightly modify the PD control by two uh, uh, changes. First, we add a constant compensation term. Uh, and since we are assuming that there are iter iterative stages in our uh, control process, we will start with a uh, in the first iteration, so i equal 1, with a u0, and then after a while we will update this to a u1, u2, and so on. And this is the first modification. The second modification is that we add a factor, gamma, to the proportional matrix uh, gain. This gamma is a simple scalar that we take as positive. In the rest of this presentation, without a lot of generality, we will uh, consider that the KP and KD matrices are chosen as diagonal and positive definite. Uh, we label Q0 as the initial robot configuration where we start from with zero velocity. And we have to initialize our feedforward term. And the easiest initialization is no knowledge about uh, any useful information, so we set u0 equal to 0. Now, if we uh, apply this control, so in the first uh, iteration this will be exactly the PD control with some positive gain uh, gamma added to the uh, proportional matrix, we will find a steady state which in general is not the one desired, the QD desired. So let's call the steady state iteration, uh, the steady state at the uh, i iteration uh, with QI for the configuration and indeed Q dot zero for the velocity. Uh, the balance will be between what we are applying in this uh, steady state. So our control law with Q dot equal to zero, uh, when we reach a configuration QI, a generic, so it will be gamma kp times qd minus qi plus the current feed forward that we are using in that iteration. This will balance the gravity at this configuration that we have reached. Now, uh, when we reach this steady state, and which is not the right one, we update the feed forward term only. So for the next iteration, uh, we will restart because we change our u i minus one, uh, and we let we replace it with u i, which has this formula, which is nothing else than the control effort that we are applying at steady state at the end of the i iteration. This will become the feed forward term only in the next iteration. Now, uh, indeed, because of the previous uh, equation, uh, this. Uh, the update is made by uh, a torque term which is equivalent to the gravity uh, at the previous reached steady state. We don't know uh, a priori what is this gravity, but we know its numerical value because it's exactly the control effort that we are applying in the known reached configuration QI. So uh, from there, uh, we can do the update law. So we will, uh, in the implementation, we will use the expression on the uh, left-hand side, 
but we know that for analysis, this will be equivalent to the gravity in the configuration that we have just reached. Now we have a theorem, a theorem that proves convergence of the sequence of uh, steady state configuration that we will uh, reach starting from a generic value Q0 and then proceeding over the iteration. Uh, the theorem says that if the minimum uh, eigenvalue of the diagonal positive definite matrix Kp is larger than alpha, remember that Kp is diagonal, so uh, this is also uh, the minimum eigenvalue is also the minimum element on the diagonal of Kp. And moreover, if we choose the factor gamma larger or equal than 2, a simple number, then uh, we can prove that the sequence converged to Qd, indeed, uh, since we are converging to a new equilibrium, then even Q dot 0 will be 0. And this is whole starting from any initial value of Q0, and in principle we could also start with a non-zero initial velocity. And this occurs globally. Now, let's comment these two conditions. The first one uh, is already known, is in fact uh, the condition that guarantees, so the sufficient condition that guarantees that we obtain global asymptotic stability if we are using a PD plus exact uh, gravity compensation at destination. So if our feed forward term is exactly the one needed at the destination, so G of QD. So we have to know the gravity term at the destination. And since this QD may be, uh, may be any uh, in the robot configuration space, we should in fact know the whole uh, gravity vector uh, functional form. Uh, the second uh, additional uh, condition, so condition B, guarantees that the iterative scheme under the hypothesis uh, of a uh, will converge and in fact uh, we'll, we will have that uh, um, converging sequence for the feed forward term will eventually be the unknown, a priori unknown uh, gravity term in the con desired configuration. The proof uses a, a concept of uh, contraction mapping and this is interesting per se. It, quite, it is quite simple, so uh, let consider, let define uh, E sub i as the error reached at the end of the i iteration, so qd minus qi. And now uh, we update our feed forward term, uh, and we know that at the end of each iteration, uh, this update will be equal to the gravity acting at that final configuration QI. So if we make the difference between two updates, UI minus UI minus one, this will be the difference between the gravity at the configuration QI and at the previous configuration, at the end of the previous iteration, QI minus one. And by the uh, bound that we know on the gradient of the gravity vector, this will be less or equal than alpha, the norm of the difference between the these two configurations. And now we make uh, a conservative uh, bound. So we add and subtract from the last term uh, the desired QD. So we build the error QI minus QD and QD minus QI minus 1. So the error at the end of iteration I and the error at the end of the previous iteration. And uh, we replace uh, this with the sum of the two norms instead of having uh, the norm of the sum. So this is quite a conservative step uh, which will make this condition actually sufficient, in fact. On the other hand, if we look at the update, the update is ui equal a gamma kpi ei plus ui minus 1, so if we reorganize term and we take the norm, and since gamma is a positive scalar can be taken out of the norm, we have that the difference between ui and ui minus 1, so remember these are uh, the feed forward term in two successive iterations, 
will be equal to gamma norm of Kp Pi. Now if we put together these two uh, equations, uh, we can uh, substitute ui minus ui minus 1 in norm in the first equation and have that look at the uh, right hand side of this chain of inequalities that gamma times the norm of kp times the error uh, at equation i is less or equal than alpha the sum of the norm of the error at the end of two successive iterations now if we go backward in these inequalities uh, indeed the norm of the matrix kp times the vector ai uh, uh, can be lower bounded by the minimum eigenvalue of the matrix kp times the norm of the vector ai and by the first assumption assumption a of the theorem the minimum eigenvalue of kp is strictly larger than alpha now if you look at the first and last of this chain of inequality taking into account a strict inequality in the first place uh, you can divide by alpha so alpha becomes irrelevant in this uh, in the sequence and then uh, divide by gamma so you have on the left hand side the norm of ei uh, so the error at the end of iteration i is strictly less than one over gamma the sum of the norm of that iteration uh, plus the norm at, at the end of the previous iteration now if you reorganize uh, this uh, inequality, so you bring the norm of the error at the end of an i iteration to the left, you will have 1 minus 1 over gamma, strictly less than 1 over gamma, the error at the previous iteration, and then you divide by this, you simplify, and you end up with this uh, very simple equation that says that the norm at the end of iteration i, uh, the norm of the error, uh, will be strictly less than 1 over gamma minus 1 the norm of the error at the previous iteration so the second assumption which says that gamma should be larger or equal than 2 it means that 1 over gamma minus 1 is uh, less or equal than 1 and since the error at the end of the uh, i iteration in norm would be strictly less than this so it will be strictly less than 1 times the previous error, we will have that from one iteration to the other, uh, the error will contract towards zero. So this is, in fact, a contraction mapping. So eventually, it will converge to norm of the error equals zero, which is exactly the thesis. So we have achieved asymptotic convergence, asymptotic as iteration pass by. We have not included any stability condition for this and in fact we don't need to have stability or to prove stability for this to converge so uh, if you look at the, the, the overall behavior the robot will move from uh, one steady state to the next steady state and at every new steady state uh, it will update the feed forward term now there are three uh, gains involved in this very simple iterative scheme uh, the kp the kd and the gamma now the kp and kd will affect uh, the transient during each of the iteration so when moving from one steady state to the next one uh, the time needed the uh, overshooting and uh, the damping that we impose will depend on the choice of kp and kd but eventually we will reach a new steady state now gamma instead uh, as you can see from the first formula in this page will affect the convergence rate from uh, one steady state to the other uh, until you get to the final desired one now uh, if you uh, combine uh, the uh, gamma factor and the gain kp knowing that the gain kp uh, the diagonal gain Kp should have the minimum uh, value on the diagonal larger than alpha and gamma should be larger or equal than 2 so you can redefine a new proportional gain matrix Kp hat and the two conditions require only that we double 
the minimum uh, value of kp hat with respect to the case of uh, knowledge of the uh, gravity theorem. So, since everything is diagonal, this implies that the minimum element in the diagonal should be uh, greater than 2 alpha. Again, as we have seen in many of the previous proofs, this is only a sufficient condition. So, if you have choose Kp hat, I would say at this stage, larger than 2 alpha, or the minimum value of Kp hat larger than 2 alpha, then you're guaranteed that you will converge. If you fail to do so, the, system, the scheme may converge or not. So, in this sense, uh, this is a, only a sufficient condition. Now, it's uh, a nice interpretation of what we are doing uh, is in terms of the addition of an integral term. In fact, every time we update our feed forward, we are using the story of the error so far up to the instant in which we uh, state that we have reached a new steady state. So, uh, instead of continuously updating the integral term uh, by using the error along the transient, we are using only the error reached at steady state, successive steady state, in order to update this term. So it's kind of a discrete version of the integral term, but discrete in the sense of events. So, updating the integral part only at a given instant of time and not accumulating the error over the transient. And the nice thing is that in, in this case, in this simplified version of the integral term, we have guaranteed convergence and global asymptotic stability, in fact, uh, without particular condition on the Kp and Kd gain, only uh, a slightly larger value for the Kp hat gain. So let's see uh, a numerical example of uh, this um, situation. Um, suppose that we have a, a 3R robot with uh, uh, equal link length, uh, 0 0.5 meters, uh, uniformly distributed mass, so they're the center of mass at the half point of these links, moving in a vertical plane, so fully subject to gravity and that the masses uh, of the three links are decreasing, 30 kilograms for the first one, 20 for the second, and 10 kilograms for the last one. If we model uh, with the, the potential energy and then the gravity term, so the gradient of the potential energy in symbolic form, and we plug in those numbers, then we can uh, easily find that uh, the value of alpha that bounds the gradient of the gravity term uh, is around 400 for this case. So, uh, our theorem says that if you choose uh, the Kp gain uh, diagonal and the least element in the diagonal, in this case a 3 by 3 matrix, uh, is uh, uh, at least 800, then you're guaranteed that you will uh, converge, uh, that the sequence uh, of, um, of uh, iterative uh, learning of the gravity term will converge. In the simulation that we have made, uh, we also included, for making it more realistic, some uh, maximum bound for the applied torque, uh, again decreasing from one joint to the other, so 800 newton meters maximum for the first uh, joint, 400 and 200 for the following one. And we have considered uh, three case studies. Now we start in every case from the initial downward equilibrium position. So 0, 0, 0 is the, uh, are the three links are straight down, downwards. So this is, uh, I would say, uh, a, a stable or asymptotically stable equilibrium uh, unforced. Uh, so if we perturb a little bit this configuration, the robot will go back to this one. So we start at rest from 0, 0, 0. In the first case, uh, we would like to move the first link by 90 degree while keeping uh, second and third straight. So from straight downward to straight horizontal. In the second case, uh, we will make a higher motion, so we will 
move uh, uh, 45 degrees more, so a total of 135, 135 degrees for joint one, and joint two and joint three uh, at the end should be again uh, straight, so that the link, the, the robot is uh, uh, in the straight configuration. And the third case is the same uh, goal, but with different gains. In fact, for the first two, we use for KP hat uh, a diagonal matrix with 1600 and 280 as gains, while the KD, uh, which should only be diagonal and, uh, and positive, in fact, the requirement of diagonality is not uh, needed, but this is a simple choice, uh, is chosen as 200, 120. There are no uh, requirement other than having positive values here. Now you can see that the first gain on joint 1, 1000, is larger than twice alpha. But the other two are smaller. So in fact, the smallest element in the diagonal of KP hand is 280. So in principle, we have no guarantee that we will be able to converge. Uh, in the third case, uh, we will use uh, a higher lowest gain, uh, but still uh, below the twice alpha value, which is 800. And the KD is chosen as before. We will see that the behavior will be different uh, between case 2 and case 3. So with this in mind, uh, here uh, you can see on the top row, uh, the joint position error, remember you're starting from 0, 0, 0 and you like to reach the configuration pi over 2, 0, 0, so the horizontal straight arm. And the uh, vertical blue lines uh, represent the end of each iteration. So you start with a pure PD and when you are reached a 3 second uh, steady state situation, you update your feed forward, which becomes from zero, it becomes the value of torque that you are applying at that joint at the end of the first iteration, and then you restart moving. Uh, at six seconds around, you reach a new steady state, you update your feed forward, and then uh, at the end of the third iteration, you are uh, practically with zero error, you are below some threshold some numerical threshold that you can uh, choose a priori. And this is done uh, for all three joints at the same time. And you can tell from the second row of plots, which are the control torques being applied during the iteration, that uh, you will start with some uh, oscillatory behavior of torques until you're stabilized to a certain value. When you update the control torque, in fact, you update only the feed forward term, so you, you are changing the torque that you are applying. So the torque is no longer the one that guarantees to be in an equilibrium, although uh, a false equilibrium, not the desired one. So you see that the torque has a jump, and this will make the robot restart. And this happens at the end of the first iteration, at the end of the second iteration, and at the end of the third iteration, there is no need to update the torque, the feed forward, because we already reached convergence so, convergence is in three updates in about nine seconds of uh, transient. In the second example, uh, we have to overcome the, let's say, the, this straight arm configuration on the horizontal line uh, is in fact the one where the gravity load is the maximum. So, we have to overcome this maximum gravity load configuration in order to reach the uh, 135 degrees of uh, joint one with respect to the downward vertical and again with the second and third link straight. You see that here the situation is similar uh, but in fact you may recognize that there are, uh, I di didn't put here the vertical lines but you can recognize a situation where uh, the motion uh, of the joints stops, in fact the error with respect to the desired configuration um, does not change, at this point you have an update of the control torques. You can tell also when the update occurs 
by looking at the control torques profile because when you see a discontinuity this is exactly when we are updating the feed forward term so the control torque will have uh, a step change and you can see that uh, there is a uh, one iteration the second iteration around uh, uh, six seconds here uh, three seconds the first six seconds the second uh, every three seconds more or less we are updating things and we have in this case convergence after five updates so at the end of the fifth iteration uh, we converge to the desired configuration so these two convergence cases are in fact despite mm, the uh, violation of the sufficient condition on the lowest gain so you may think that uh, in this other case when we reduce the highest gain but in fact we increase the lowest one uh, in this case is the same task as the second case but with uh, proportional gains or equal to 500 so the lowest gain is uh, larger than alpha, but still uh, smaller than 2 alpha, which would be 8 times. So what happens? You can see that after some, uh, let's say the first and second iteration, the behavior becomes uh, repetitive. In fact, the joint position error does not converge to zero. So you see that uh, after uh, about six seconds i would say uh, the uh, joint position error has stabilized so we do the update we have a new equilibrium state being reached at the end of, of the second iteration but from there on the system repeats a motion from one uh, equilibria to another equilibria and back so there is a limit cycle in a sense but no convergence to the desired equilibrium which is with a configuration 3 pi over 4, 0, 0. And similarly, you can see that the control torques becomes periodic. Uh, but uh, this uh, is not, so the, the system is not diverging, but it's never converging. It uh, stays to some kind of local minima, from one local minima to the other local minima, uh, a bit above the desired value of Q1, a bit below, and with the other two joints also not placed correctly. In fact, uh, you never find a zero uh, in the upper plots for any of the three joints. So you see that the system cannot converge if you violate the sufficient condition. It may converge if you violate, and it certainly will converge if you don't violate the sufficient condition. So, uh, final comments on this very simple law. It's a uh, a uh, first example of uh, learning in the sense that without knowledge of the uh, model terms in particular of the gravity terms but also of any other terms of the dynamic model only a bound, an upper bound is known uh, on the gradient of the gravity terms so without any a priori knowledge by applying a PD control plus this special kind of fit forward we learn something at every iteration. No? We learn from the error, in a sense, no? from the error, from one iteration to the other. And this error uh, allows us to learn the correct gravity compensation at the destination. Of course, if we have a new task, uh, a new uh, desired QD, then what we have learned so far uh, is more or less of little use. So we could start with a u0 being the uh, learned term for the current uh, configuration which is the end of the previous task but from there on uh, we have to learn again online uh, what is needed um, so this is a comment that i already made on the sufficiency condition on the proportional gain um, and in fact when you see that violating the sufficient condition you don't get the expected results. This gives you also a measure of distance between uh, uh, the sufficient condition and the necessary ones. Of course, if you, by chance, find that every time you violate the sufficient condition, you fail, then it's very likely that your sufficient conditions are also necessary. But this is not the case. 
Now, there's a, another comment which is kind of expl uh, explaining why we get convergence despite we fail to satisfy the sufficient condition in terms of the gains. And uh, the fact that this, uh, this uh, lower bounds that we have to satisfy takes into account the robot as a whole. There's no detailed analysis of the fact that uh, in order to overcome this local minima of uh, gravity action which prevents the scheme to converge, uh, we don't consider the difference between uh, uh, links in the serial chain. Now, with reference exactly to the considered uh, simulation case study, uh, it is rather obvious that the last joint will have to sustain under gravity only the last link. The before last joint has to sustain under gravity the second link and also the third one. And so, going backward to the base, the first joint has to sustain the gravity load of the whole, of the entire uh, robotic structure. So, in this planar case, things are particularly obvious, but this is, in general, pretty much true for all serial manipulators also moving in 3D. So, uh, implicitly, uh, one would say that the gains at the first joint in the sequence should be higher because they have to overcome the gravity effect, which is larger because it includes more links in the picture. And the smaller gains, the lower bound for the gains uh, on the distal joints, is allowed to be smaller. But indeed, one should refine the analysis in order to prove this, which is, for me at least, an intuitive result. And this explains also why um, in the first two cases we had convergence, because we had enough, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an, enough uh, large gains on the joints that uh, needed to have this strong proportional action. Uh, another practical uh, aspect is that we have assumed that we have reached at every time, at, every, at the end of each iteration, we have uh, reached uh, a steady state with zero velocity and with a constant uh, position error. Now, if you look carefully in this, you may realize that uh, those steady states are assumed asymptotically, so as time goes to infinity. So every single iteration should last an infinite amount of time. And since there are, in principle, an infinite number of iterations, each one contracting the error to zero, but not in a finite number of uh, steps, we have a doubly, double infinite time to wait in order to converge. In practice, this is not true, because we can set, as we did in this numerical uh, simulation and also in the experiment that we conducted with this uh, scheme, we set suitable threshold. And when we are getting close enough to the, the, uh, the next steady state, which means that the joint velocity are close to zero and the variation of the position is below, uh, in a given interval of time, is below some uh, small threshold. So we are practically stopping. So we can consider that as a practical steady state reach and update our uh, feed forward term in the iterative scheme. So this is really the difference between the theoretical results and its practical implementation. So we have uh, done a, a number of experiments. This is a, quite an old uh, piece of research conducted in our lab. And I would like to present you uh, only one particular extension uh, dealing with uh, uh, a flexible robot that we have designed and, and uh, built, actually, in our lab uh, in the 90s. Uh, first of all, I would like to show you um, a couple of videos, very old-fashioned, I would say, um, concerning control problem for a simple uh, robots, a one-link robot and a two-link robot, with flexible distributed flexibility along the link. So on the left hand side you see uh, a device which uh, with a 70 centimeter long 
aluminum beam, which is very flexible in the plane of motion. So it can deform at the tip by an amount of, let's say, 70 centimeter long, about 15 centimeter, okay, from the uh, rigid equivalent structure while moving. Uh, there's a heavy motor, a uh, direct drive motor, so that you don't need to amplify torque because the, the structure is relatively um, lightweight, in fact, less than one kilogram in total. And uh, the, the task here was uh, moving uh, from rest to rest this flexible link uh, without caring about intermediate deformation, so it's really a regulation task but reaching the final new equilibrium with the undeformed link in a fixed amount of time. Uh, in this case, one second. Okay. So you see that the evolution... Okay, you see that you barely see vibration and oscillation, but during the motion, as, uh, as you can see from the two uh, picture, the two snapshot taken from the video below, uh, there is deformation. But indeed, at the final instant of time, the formation will be zero, motion will be zero, and we have reached uh, the final uh, equilibrium. So in this case, there was no gravity, and uh, this result was obtained by applying PD plus a suitable feed-forward uh, computer based on the model. Uh, the second uh, short clip, I would say a few seconds, uh, is the only trace that we have of the flex arm, which is the two-link experimental arm that we designed in our lab. Uh, the first link is uh, short and rigid, the second link is flexible, again with sectors that uh, avoid torsion or bending under gravity, uh, so the only deformation uh, and vibration occurs in the plane of motion. And you can see here uh, uh, a special control law which uh, allows the tracking of desired trajectory for the end effect of this flexible link, uh, of this flexible arm, uh, in planar motion. So the motion is 45 degrees for the first link and 45 degrees for the second link, and you see that we realize, uh, after some final transient, the desired configuration. And we have made a, a number of uh, uh, other addressed and solved other control problem on this tractor, in particular on the second one, uh, which has also a critical feature uh, for those of you who are more interested in control. Um, the end effector of this tractor uh, has a non-minimum non phase characteristic. So when we will talk about inversion control or feedback minimization control, this is not possible uh, for such structures. So it's a quite challenging control task. But let's go back to our case. So the iterative learning control that I have presented for rigid robots, in fact, has been extended also to situations in which flexibility is present. And in fact, uh, two types of flexibility. So rigid link, but concentrated elasticity at the joints because of the use of uh, particular transmission elements like harmonic troughs, or fully distributed along the links. Indeed, the problem is having gravity. So, in order to test this on uh, our two-link flex arm, uh, it was called the DIS flex arm, this was the old name of our department, uh, we have done a, a, a small trick. So, we have moved the base, uh, we have tilted the base from the horizontal by six degrees, uh, so that the robot would fall uh, uncontrolled, would fall uh, in the lowest configuration, straight uh, downwards, let's say, to the right in this, in this picture. So we have included gravity in the picture. Uh, iterative control can be used to regulate um, in those type of uh, robots uh, either the motor position, if you do uh, if a joint flexible joint case, or the base of the flexible links. So it's like when you're having a, um, a long beam and you're controlling the base of the beam, not the tip. In fact, in robotics we are usually interested in the uh, tip position of our structure, so at the Cartesian level. 
So I'm presenting here uh, the version of this iterative learning control uh, which achieve regulation uh, at the Cartesian level. So while including all the flexibility. And for doing this, uh, the iterative scheme has been uh, slightly modified into a double iterative scheme. And we will see uh, in the next slide how this was done. So first of all, uh, the motion test, from which I'm presenting the experimental result, is going from the straight downward configuration. So where the arm is straight, the first link, remember, is rigid. The second is the flexible one. But in this configuration, everything is in the form. So we are uh, pointing downward uh, on the inclined plane of motion. And then uh, the task was to move uh, the first link to 90 degrees and having the tip angle uh, at zero degrees. So the uh, flex arm would be uh, deformed by the presence of gravity, but the tip would be at the same level of the prolongation of the, of the first link, as if the robot had a second rigid link, okay? So the double iterative scheme, which is taken from this uh, old paper by myself and uh, a former PhD student who is now a professor at Roma 3, Stefano Pansieri, uh, is, uh, includes the, the memory part, no? so the, the update from uh, UI minus one to UI, uh, with the law that we have seen, the PD control, and everything is closed with reference to a desired uh, position at the base of the robot. So this would be a single iterative scheme which guarantees that we bring the base of the uh, flexible link and also the uh, base of the rigid link, the first rigid link, which is exactly equal to the tip of, its, uh, of this segment, to a desired value. Indeed, this desired value should be corrected itself. Uh, we should have an external memory effect uh, so to correct the reference in such a way that the tip, the actual output of the system, the tip angle, uh, is uh, aligned with the first link, like in the picture uh, on top left of this slide. So this is the double memory scheme, the double iterative scheme that is made uh, recursively. And you can see that um, in, the, in the plots, that in just three iterations, we are able to bring the system in the desired configuration. Uh, again, the first link position has some transient. You start with a pure PD control, and then you update the fit forward term, and then uh, you update also the reference position uh, for the outer loop. And you see that the tip angle also converges to its desired value. So the first link goes to 90 degrees, the tip angle uh, is zero with respect to the 90 degrees of the first rigid link. Now, indeed, uh, we had some sensor measuring, measuring the deformation. We didn't use at all this for feedback control, but we used for testing what was going on on the flexible link. And you can see in the last uh, plots that, in fact, uh, there is a final deflection due to the presence of gravity. So despite of this, the tip of the second link is where it should be. And this concludes this lecture. Thank you for listening.